rounds. Uh, we're going to get started on time because I know there's going to be a lot of information that we need to learn from Dr. Sorescu. Um, and so I think most people here are familiar with our speaker who's been gracious enough to do this many, many times uh, and share with his knowledge with us many times. So Dr. Sorescu uh, is a social professor within the Division of Cardiology. Um, he is our heart failure expert uh, here and uh, has won multiple teaching awards, has won the Golden Apple definitely many, many times and uh, for good reason. So I uh, look forward to hearing about this topic today. All right. Thank you, Nob. Um, so um, I, I thought I'm going to try to uh, review the really the best evidence-based medicine we have at least in the uh, treatment of, uh, uh, of shocks in general. We actually have a lot for septic shock, believe it or not, and vasodilator shock, not so much for cardiogenic shock, but I'll do my best to review that. And at the end of the day, the mortality for acute cardiogenic shocks is 30 days mortality is still about 40 to 45 percent. So despite everything we have there, even with the current <laughs> devices that we have, Impella, uh, balloon pumps, uh, percutaneous VADs, we still not really have made a major impact there. So really, in a way, medical therapy is still the mainstream of what we do. And of course, it's very difficult to perform medical therapy unless you have, in this particular advanced situations, unless you have also a, uh, a way of invasive uh, monitor this. And I'm going to, of course, try to show how we can use the idea of a swan gas catheter nowadays uh, into tailoring that therapy to try to bridge the patient to get the best of both worlds until we come up with better. Uh, and so uh, basically the purpose is, first of all, is how to really uh, use invasive hemodynamics monitoring to diagnose and treat cardiogenic shock. Uh, I will uh, make a, a statement here. Uh, maybe most of you are aware that uh, this actually has been tested whether swan gans catheters are useful uh, to improve mortality or morbidity in these patients in acute uh, critical care setting. Uh, particularly, the, uh, we have lots of studies both on the critical care side and on cardiology side. And the data most of the time is actually negative. So actually prospective randomized studies were negative in terms of showing that using the swans gang catheters on large scale uh, improve mortality. Having said that, in certain subsets of patients, for example, use of nitroprusside in patients with critical aortic stenosis prior to surgery uh, actually showed that it does improve mortality. In other words, if it's really done in selected patients, I think until pretty much otherwise, they're still going to be useful. And I hope I'll show you an algorithm, a clinical algorithm, how we can do that. We still need to have uh, to use those patients. So I'm not here to debate whether we should use the swans or not. I'm here is for those patients we select, what can what can we do our best to use them and the, uh, put them at best use. Uh, second, review clinical trials using pressors in managing cardiogenic shock and you know, vasodilator shock. Third. Understand the guidelines and the clinical algorithms, current guidelines and algorithms uh, that could diagnose and manage cardiogenic, and especially mixed cardiogenic and vasodilator shock. Um, in my experience, of course, in clinical trials, we only study ideally one spectrum or another. Ideally, you identify patients with septic shock, enroll them in the septic shock trial, you have a question, you find an answer. Same for cardiogenic shock. Those who work in the ICUs, I see you know, 71 ICU, where it's 21 ICU, uh, or you know, 11 ICU, or 40 CCU, I can tell you in my experience, if I were to pick a number out of a hat, I would say maybe 20% uh, uh, of 20, 25% of the time, it's a pure cardi uh, you know, cardiogenic shock or septic shock. I would say the rest of 50% is probably a mixed picture. That gets us very confused where those clinical trials don't necessarily apply. They will have to use our best judgment to see how. And I hope I can show you how we can reconcile that. And that's why I picked that up here. All right, so the best way is to start with a, with a case study. Let's hope we'll use this as a platform. So we have here a 70, sorry, we have a 75 years old man with history of diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, presented about 36 hours after he had a large anterior MI, basically, uh, associated with shortness of breath and diaphoresis. Uh, a, um, a, uh, I'm sorry, he was found with ST elevation in fuel MI with posterior wall extension, was transferred midtown for imaging on cath and PTCA. Uh, cath shows she's got three vessel coronary disease, a 90% proximal LED, 
75% distal RCA. And really the main culprit artery was the left circ, which was a dominant left circ. That means the inferior wall artery was coming off from left circ, uh, which happens only in 20% of situations opposed to right coronary artery. Overall, the ejection fraction was 35%. Uh, and of course, when, by the time he gets into a cath lab, uh, he's in respiratory distress, he gets intubated, placed on mechanical ventilator uh, with pulmonary edema. Uh, this is not his EKG, but it's just an EKG that will look like in this particular setting. So this, if this patient were to present to our ER, you always have to worry when you see, sure, you see the ST elevation 2, 3, and AVF, so that's very easy to diagnose. But once you see this extreme uh, ST depression V2, uh, think that this is particular with ST elevation continuous in V6. This is actually an inferior lateral extension of this inferior wall. And then think that this particular ST depression V2 is the mirror image of an ST elevation in V7, V8, V9, which will be the posterior wall if you were to put the leads all the way down there. So it's very important to think then, hold on a second, this could be a, a, uh, a dominant left circ with a a posterior wall extension, and if there is a patient that will get developed as a complication, a mechanical complication, acute ischemic mitral regurgitation, and these are the patients who develop that in a setting NMI. So this patient, even their ejection fraction may not be so bad from a left cirrhotic disease, they can go on flash pulmonary edema out of proportion with the ejection fraction, and again, it's the dominant left cirrhotic patients, because those anterior and popular, and particularly the posterior pop muscle, get supply usually from a PDA and from an OM. So if they both come from the same artery, it gets infarct, those are more likely to get the ischemic MR-related posterior pop muscle. So that's just a, it's more of a cardiology issues, but it's important to know and think it through if, you see, if you're involved with that. So if this patient now, uh, blood pressure is 80 over 60, is intubated, he's got a heart rate of 70 in sinus rhythm, uh, is you know 40 percent oxygen. It's been started to stabilize the blood pressure on on high dose pressor. Those what I call dopamine here at 10. Uh, the record really shows an EF of 35 percent to 40 percent, which is not that bad compared to how sick the patient is. Because we we see all the time, and usually expect somebody with cardiogenic shock with a large anterior wall MI to the ejection fraction drop to 20 percent, not with the lesser territory inferior wall MI territory. Then you got already renal failure, creatinine of two. Uh, it really doesn't respond, seem to respond well to a pre decent dose, 120 milligrams of furosemide. Uh, uh, obvious exact three vessel disease with a culprit left circ. Surgeons are consulted. Was felt that you know uh, they cannot really fix this in the cath lab uh, appropriately. So the only catch was this patient presented with a study in course about 36 hours after actually the symptoms started. So in this setting. Uh, particularly with a fresh of mine completed going on, uh, patient not doing well, really the surgeons are not easy to uh, to take the patient to OR. And we know if you take them OR when they're so sick, they're not going to make it out of it. So I, I, I can see. So they decided to delay the surgery and uh, they placed a balloon pump to help uh, with the hemodynamic support and was admitted to cardiovascular ICU. Um, so... Before I proceed, I wanted to show you, I'm going to talk about medical therapy, but I'm going to have a couple of slides just to review how about device therapy for this acute, obvious extreme emergencies, at least the data that we have. And really, there are several uh, trials, prospective randomized, that have been attempted throughout the last 20, 30 years with the balloon pumps. Probably the single most important we think is as good as it gets right now is actually the, uh, it's called SHOCK2 trial with balloon pump, was published, was really done. Uh, mostly in Germany, it's published in 2012, and it's published in the England Journal. And these are patients with acute MI, most of them low EF from the acute MI. They underwent in, in, in urgent revascularization, but at the same time support with the balloon pump. And if you use the balloon pump and then use the balloon pump, you see by 30 days, it wasn't really any difference. Uh, in terms of the mortality. Of course, they got everything else similar. So it's kind of underwhelming, but when they follow up to three months, some of these patients did have a certain subset, particularly the ones who uh, who had were successfully revascularized actually had a better mortality. So it doesn't mean that it doesn't really help, but it doesn't help necessarily everybody, particularly the super sick ones, they are not able to revascularize in time. But that's the data so far. Uh, then how about the newer devices? We have now a, what do you call a percutaneous left of uh, LVAD, it's, it's called a tandem device, 
And then there is also an impeller, which is like a pump that goes across the aortic valve and it spins and pulls the blood back into the... And we have various versions of some of them are 2.5 liters, some of them up to 5 liters. And really, this is a meta-analysis that reviewed this recently. And I can tell you is that uh, while the impella or VADs versus the balloon pump do improve the hemodynamics. We have a higher cardiac index. These are three different trials. These two are the LVAD, uh, you know, uh, percutaneous LVAD. The last one is a balloon pump uh, versus LVAD. Uh, and uh, basically, yes, they improve the cardiac index. They improve the hemodynamics. They drop the cardiac feeling pressure. Uh, but at the end of the day, when you look at mortality data, whether it's impella, VAD versus medical therapy or uh, uh, balloon pump versus impella, there's really no major difference. Uh, so at the end of the day, all comers, again, some of these studies are very, very small numbers, okay? So really, we don't have a final answer. Uh, you know, they may design that. But at this point, balloon pump is approved if, uh, to be used for uh, uh, QTMI in the setting of cardiogenic shock. The impella has not been approved for that. It's actually approved for high-risk coronary interventions in the setting of uh, uh, with or without acute MI, but not, definitely not for the actual cardiogenic shock. And this is where we are. And they do come with a price, with bleeding. Uh, bleeding was excessive with the impella. Uh, in terms of risk of strokes, they're always higher compared to medical therapy in this particular patient, so you have to be careful with, uh, with that. So in conclusion, if I were to look in this particular condition, Using medical uh, mechanical device therapy and uh, drug therapy, we still have about 30 days mortality of 30 to 45 percent, uh, 40 to 45 percent, and that's a good outcome from the most recent clinical trials. Where we learn to be much faster with everything, uh, but really overall, we can't really put all the weight on just mechanical devices, and we're going to have to. At the end of the day, we still have to focus on the the other 55 to 60 we're supposed to save, and I thought I'm going to discuss the next 45 minutes or so about how, what we can do the best to help those patients with optimized medical therapy. Uh, so next day, this particular patient, the, FI, the oxygen demand has increased. It's got worse respiratory failure, worse pulmonary edema. Uh, the blood pressure is going down. They had to go up on dopamine to press her dose 20 mics. Uh, it becomes oliguric, almost anuric. Kidney is worse. That's when they consulted the heart failure to medical optimize the patient. All right, and um, so, and usually when I thought it through, I knew the original echo didn't show any significant mitral regurgitation, but logistically, I also know that particularly if it's acute, it's, the jet is very eccentric. You really have to look very carefully. Sometimes we've got to do a T to really confirm that. And that's exactly what happens when you get these patients. The mechanism of this ischemic MR, usually if you were to look from these long parastanal uh, uh, axes, you have this, in fear world, the pop, posterior pop matter so is tethered, is scarred, or if you want, is froze. So when the heart contracts, this leaflet is pulled instead of really going back here and make a cooptation. Because of that, you get the ischemic, eccentric, and mitral regurgitation jet that sometimes it's, it's easy to see the chronic one when the LV is dilated. It's kind of difficult to see it in acute. So I insist, and I got, we got a TEE, and it, that really confirmed that the patient did have severe my acute mitral regurgitation. So now that explains, I dropped the EF, I also have acute ischemic mitral regurgitation, and patients basically developing already lung uh, problem, respiratory failure, and acute uh, renal failure from that. So the question is, is there anything we can do to try to really medical optimize, stop this from getting worse? You have to understand, doctor, uh, uh, the surgeon asked me, unless that creatinine gets close to one, I'm not going to do anything about it. And he was getting close to FIO2 of 100% max out. So it wasn't really looking good. So this patient, uh, we placed us one because I felt it's impossible to do this without that. We got, uh, here are the numbers. An index of 1.8, SVI is 2200, mean arterial pressure is 77, CVP8, wedge of 28. So the question is, what do we do next? Now, I know that probably about 9% of those who are here in the audience will never have to uh, you know, manage a swan. But that's not the point here. The point is to try to go into what would be the gold standard therapy, identify the principle and the strategy, and then whether you have a milder case or, that, or different case, able to recognize and use clinical tools that we have. So this is more of a, a paradigm of how we can do that. And I promise you, each and every one of you, even if I look like I 
talk very technical details is going to help a lot anybody who can potentially be involved in this patient whether it's in the emergency room on the floor or uh, uh, on the uh, in the ICU so so where do you start what do we think is if I wanted to fix this patient I have these three numbers an index is low obvious cardiogenic shock less than 2.2 I have an SVR of 2200 and I have Relative, the right side pressure seems to be fine, CVP. The wedge is 28. So where, which one do I want to attack first? What am I going to do? Remember, we have very limited blood pressure here. It's very low. You know, systolic pressure is still in the 80, 85. And to me, it always makes sense to start with by far the one that it, it's, if I have an impact on it, it's going to be the most dynamic relationship there. And system vascular resistance is by far the one we can get the most rewards. Now you can understand that when we swan the patient, the system vascular resistance is 2,200. And normally, it's 1,000, right? So suddenly, you have twice more than what you expect. So theoretically, it will, it will encourage me to use a vasodilator to drop that system vascular resistance to increase the cardiac output, also improve mitral regurgitation. But there is a catch. If I don't have the swan, would you feel comfortable to use a vasodilator when you have to use high-dose dopamine to have a systolic pressure of 80? So it's going to be a very tricky business to do that without the proper invasive measurement. But there's also something else. Really, why is it that the SVI is 2200, really, on somebody with a systolic pressure of 85? You know? And it's very simple. Here, dopamine okay, is really a disease for this patient. It's not helping. What you do with dopamine you vasoconstrict and no blood goes into the small vascular bed beyond the arterioli. Everything is kept central. While you fix a number, which is the miniature pressure or systolic pressure, you're actually aggravating the cardiac output and you're getting, you know, the blood goes back into the lung, nothing in front and nothing goes into the periphery. So this is actually, and we actually have tested, this is one of the studies, all comers with shock. It doesn't matter what's cardiogenic shock, septic shock, uh, uh, um, uh, intravascular, you know, hemorrhagic shock, and if you, they were randomized, this is a, a famous study by now, it's in 2010, that's probably the best we have so far, and they randomized all comers with shock, they were randomized to norepinephrine versus dopamine, they want to know, is there any difference between these guys, theoretically, norepinephrine has the, you know, the better effect at higher dose at 10 mics, but starts with alpha at any level, uh, so it has a little bit of everything, except doesn't have the beta 2, which is the epinephrine version of it, which is a vasodilator. Where dopamine, a low dose renal dose, helps with the kidney perfusion. Uh, anything higher than 5 starts to recruit the alpha and vasoconstrictor, and higher than 10, you start to have the beta effect. And actually, it's the other way around. Sorry, 5 to 10 is the beta, and then you have the alpha from 10 and higher. And to their surprise, while this was a... a more of a post hoc analysis when they separate subgroups, and we got to be careful how we interpret this. But really, the cardio patients who turns out they have cardiogenic shock had worse outcome with high dose dopamine, what I call pressor. And this could be one of the reasons because if your if your problem is pure cardiogenic shock, your system vascular is you're already very vasoconstricted, and you use a pressor that will just close that faucet even more. Then that's not going to help. All right now. Why would norepinephrine do better? Because it's got alpha blood, you know, alpha agonism even better than the dopamine agonism, right? It's more powerful. Because also what norepinephrine does, it has also a lot more beta one. It's actually a very potent inotrope through beta, way more powerful than dopamine. So I, saw may, I think maybe it compensate that way. Having said that, that's where we are. So keep in mind, high dose dopamine more than 10 mics is no good uh, for uh, patients with cardiogenic shock. And let me try then to see how we can interpret those one number. We're going to go back to some uh, 100 years old cardiac physiology. Uh, it looks complicated, but it's really not that complicated, okay? And again, we're going to use this just as a paradigm, how to interpret then at bedside the actually uh, vitals. And basically, Frank Starling Law says that the higher the cardiac filling pressure is here, so let's say it's the right arterial pressure of 5, you can go all the way up to 18 or 11 can diastolic pressure, the higher the cardiac output. And really the point of maximum relationship for normal heart, ejection fraction 65%, is actually at about 18, wedge of 18. So even people with normal hearts, if suddenly you try to run a marathon, things that you haven't prepared for, you get shorter breath. That means you reach your age of 18. That's how you got to stop. So the body is doing what it needs to do. Increase the preload, get more blood in the lung. Unfortunately, heart is not ready to do that. So you get shorter breath, all right? So that, but that allows you to optimize your stroke volume for that. Now, uh, if you have the a weaker 
and lower e ejection fraction. All right, the weaker and the lower, you see how the shape of this uh, changes. Now we have more of a bell shape. And even if polyethyl maximum relationship used to be 18 back then, this particular patient is at ejection fraction of 20. You see how it shifts to the left? It looks like it may like a wedge more of a 15 or 14. So actually, contrary to what we were taught, the lower the wedge, the better is for actually weak failing heart. And there is no, uh, and, and that's very important to realize. Also, realize the same wedge of 18 or LVDB of 18 or, uh, is going to be actually deleterious by itself to drop the cardiac output. You function on the negative side of the starting curve. This particular patient has a wedge of 28. That means it's way down here. So just having stretch heart is going to do that. All right. And ideally, what you want to do, well, if I want to tune him up so I can take him off, I need to shift him to the left, and I'll improve the cardiac output by about 50%. Now, it is true also that the heart is not only, it's also preload dependent on the weak heart. So I'm not saying that, well, you got to there is somebody, make sure they got no blood pressure. That's the only time so rescue is going to accept a U-volemic patient for, with heart failure. That is not true. It is true that I'm just pointing out we're very familiar with the preload concept. Yes. A uh, ejection fraction of 20% big floppy heart will start to become hypotensive way earlier than somebody who's an ejection fraction normal. So me and you, I haven't eaten anything since last night and didn't drink anything but a coffee. My CVP could be zero, but that doesn't mean I'm passing out and my stroke volume is low because my pressure grain across the two beds are very good and you keep sucking it. But a patient with an EF of 20 uh, will pass out probably if the right atrial pressure is less than five. So it does become, you know, preload dependent more than me and the worse the heart that then that interval between preload and afterload narrows and that's all it means but it also likes lower cardiac feeding pressure not 18 not 20 not 25 it's actually less and same applies for the right ventricular function so that's one so now the rest what i do i have this as a, a cartoon in my mind and each time i look at the patient whether it's at bedside or it's in the icu looking at this one i'm trying to figure I'm trying to get the patient at this maximum relationship, either on a horizontal axis or on a vertical axis. I show you the horizontal. I want them to be wedged not too high. I don't want to be too low. All right. I, when, how do I know when I'm too low when patient's hypotensive from that? All right. How do I know when it's too high? Cardiac clean pressure estimates or invasive or non-invasive physical exam, you know, symptoms, that kind of stuff. How about the vertical relationship? That will be the afterload. Here's how you think. So I want to get the patient here. Now, if this particular patient has an SVR of 2,000 with that mirror to your pressure, and it keeps him suppressed here. If I were to increase this SVR to actually 1,500, I decrease it to 1,500, decrease map, or even to all the way to 1,000, of course, I'm making up this number, but the direction is what really matters, okay? You notice that I can actually double. The impact on cardiac output is much higher. What happens, imagine this curve that I suddenly just shifted up parallel at that particular level. So again, the impact of afterload on an instantaneous starting fun uh, uh, curve function is vertical. Lots more impact on cardiac output than preload, which is more uh, exponential. And then if I were to say, okay, how about the inotropy if I was to use the inotropy, where do I shift this point? And it's gonna be somewhere in the middle. And that's pretty much all the data show, the basic physiologic data and everything else. So again, this is just showing you the direction where you go. So if I am with this patient, I'm suppressed after load this here. I can increase the cardiac output if I can get that after load close normalized. So move it. I need to move the curve up and I need to move it eventually to the left. And meanwhile, I can't blood pressure is low. I might need to use an iotrope to really help to support that while I'm getting my after load where it needs to do and my preload the way it needs to do. And that's pretty much should be the strategy. So goal for this particular patient is to improve cardiac output, increase organ perfusion, reduce the SVR. I don't like ranges because ranges are not goals and target of therapy. I, for me, I just say SVR is 1,000. I want a miniature pressure of 70, which is about SVR of 1,000 for somebody who doesn't have prior hypertension. You know, because of course you have prior high blood pressure, that you have a different goal and different set. But let's assume this patient didn't have that. So I want SVR to be around 1,000. And of course, because the blood pressure is so low, I, ideally, I'm thinking, okay, this is high dose dopamine, it's too much pressure, it's contrary to the SVR, I want to take it away. But I can't take it away without having such support. So first, this is where I'm going to add my dobutamine, the inotrope. You know, let's give it there, I've got nothing to lose. Uh, and then I'm going to try to see little by little I can wean off the inotrope, keep measuring the SVR with this one. And this is what we got, an index now at 2.1, uh, an SVR of 1600, 
wedge 28, this time completely off, uh, complete off 20 mics of dopamine. So that ECR is already coming down, but I'm not there. I improved the index a little bit. I'm not there. Wedge is still high. Now remember when we, edge, we measure wedge on somebody with severe MR, we're actually measuring the MR. So really the true LVDP will be only if we drop the catheter in the left ventricle here. So part of that is confusing from the actual mitral regurgitation. I have to rely on these numbers. And E at bedside, we actually, you'll be surprised. You can identify a lot of these patients on the floor getting admitted with low cardiac output. The difference is they afford to be on the floor because this is a converted from acute to chronic, chronic market regurgitation, chronic low, you know, uh, heart failure. And that allows the compensatory mechanism that you can deal, that you can walk around with the wedge of 28, even lie flat, and actually don't see much, and they can see on the floor. So to me, I'm going to give you this formula. If I don't have a swan, the next to a swan to guesstimate uh, the best, the the system vascular resistance is really, you see, it's a mean arterial pressure minus CVP times the number divided by cardiac output, which is in proportion with MAP. So really, mean arterial pressure, it's a way superior marker if I were to guesstimate uh, instead of just systolic or just diastolic. And also, I like to use the pulse pressure, and we'll talk about that. So this is what I like. I like to look at MAP. Of course, somebody who's more hypertensive will be a higher MAP. All we know in patients with systolic heart or cardiogenic shock with a MAP, uh, a mean arterial pressure less than 65, it's absolute hypotension. So I'll give you some extreme. I know when it's low, and I know when it's high, and the rest we're going to have to work with that. And so below 65, we got to do, so, can't use vasodilator got by themselves. You got to do, and you got to use pressors or inotropes. If it's higher, around 70 is usually equivalent of a SPI of 1,000. Anything higher than 80 or 90, usually it's a high system vascular resistance. So we like to be around 70 plus minus. And that's what I'm saying here. So again, at bedside, look at the map, look at the pulse pressure. If I get a map of 90 and the patient clears in renal failure, didn't respond directly, looks a little cool, that's a patient who probably has low cardiac output, even if he's gotten used to, okay? Uh, and this particular patient, basically the faucet, the kidney faucet is being closed, is fighting the heart and it's worsening. I like to make it uh, to really think everything is uh, really at the end of the day, all this fight with elevated system vascular resistance from neural hormones in heart failure, is really fight two thirds of this system vascular resistance because of the kidneys. The fight starts at the kidney, and really this is where it's amplified. And we know that because once you develop renal failure, that's it's telling you where is the most of, of uh, vasoconstriction. And and there and now what I need to do is try to get this uh, system vascular resistance low so I can improve the perfusion. This particular patient with an SVR of 2,000, the kidneys are not perfused, muscles are not perfused, it's on the cold side, and it's fighting the heart and lowering cardiac output. And I'm here is to show that indeed, this has been done, this study has been done, and show that actually, the worse the cardiac, cardiogenic shock, the higher the renal vascular resistance. So kidney feels there is low blood supply and it's shutting itself down because it knows it's the biggest user and it's trying to preserve the blood for the rest of the body. And that's okay acutely, but chronically is not good. Uh, one thing that's very interesting here, notice the renal blood flow does go down here, all right, but uh, which is expecting from the very beginning. But if you just measure GFR, the GFR itself is a measure of cardiac index. You've got to go to the extreme of an index way less than 1.5 to actually by itself justifies the renal failure as measured by either creatine or GFR, okay? So, in other words, really, it might... The renal failure that we're creating it's already high, even with an index that is not, so, you know, it's around two, it's telling me the other things going on that's causing that renal failure. So really, this is very important take home message. There's not just cardiogenic shock, but probably here the acute mitral regurgitation, everything going backwards. Maybe the dopamine high dose pressure was also aggravating that. So if I were to treat this patient now, I identify the problem. Uh, I, I want to really try to improve SVR, uh, system vascular resistance, improve the afterload, lower the cardiac feeling pressure, decongest, and reverse renal dysfunction. And these are the agents that we have available, all right? Inotropes, I put them at the end. Diuretics, I put here to give the last. I'm going to briefly go over some of these options that we know of. And unfortunately, we have mostly physiologic data. We don't necessarily have prospective randomized studies that I can show you, and I wish I could. But at least the physiologic studies we have, I'm going to show you. Nitroglycerin, the most used for acute pulmonary edema, cardiogenic shock. Uh, what do we know about the physiology, how it works? Yes, if you use 
nitroglycerin in this patient, you drop the uh, blood pressure, the heart rate may increase a little bit, but not much. You increase the cardiac index by uh, about 30%, and rest of the cardiac feeling pressures, they go nicely down, including the system vascular resistance. And both left and right side, of course, to achieve both of those, to be a arterial vasodilator and a venous vasodilator, you have to go to doses at 200 mics per minute. So those who have used to titrate those doses, you know, what do we start in for acute coronary syndrome, you know, angina? We start at 10, 20 mics, right? And to really go to 200 mics, whether it's in CCU or not, I can tell you nurses are very, don't like it because they feel very, you know, uncomfortable. Doctors don't like it. And I tell you, I don't like it as a heart failure physician. Why? Because 100 mics dissolving normal saline in our pharmacy is 100 cc an hour of normal saline. So I don't know what we're gaining here. All right? So there are some problems with it. And there is more. In other words, I have to go to really big dose of it to do the heart failure therapy as opposed to angina therapy. Now, angina therapy, 10, 20 mics will do the job because that works equivalent of biological endothelial nitric oxide synthase, which is in endothelial cells. And that's for coronary vasorelaxation. So low dose, low output uh, nitric oxide synthase. To uh, do this uh, lowering cardiac filling pressure, you have to go to the high output equivalent of nitric oxide synthase. That's the INOS, inflammatory nitric oxide. That's from macrophages. That's the one we use in septic shock. And that's how we get the, you know, then we get the, uh, the need for pressors. So again, basically, what we do, we use equivalents of nitroglycerin in heart failure here. There will be equivalent to natural septic shock that's occurring to override this extreme neurohormone activation. But when you do that, it's excellent, but there are some good news and there are some bad news. So here's the good news. High-dose nitro, flash pulmonary edema presenting to emergency room as opposed to Lasix. If so, if you everybody got here, this study was published in Lancet, they presented with acute heart failure and flash pulmonary edema. About 50% next day would have been on the breathing machine. They were randomized. Everybody got a dose of laces, dose of nitro. And the thought process was, which one is going to do better if we double up on the furosemide or diuretic effect or we double up on nitrates? And indeed, if you double up on nitrates, you can see that only 10% next day were on the mechanical ventilator in the ICU. So that's actually pretty good. While the one that you keep gumming up on diuretics, Actually, up to 35, 40% when that. That's four times worse. So you know those people are pretty sick, and you know if you have this outcome, that is really important. So yes, if my goal for this patient, if I have enough blood pressure room here, right, and my goal is to prevent them from going to uh, into on the mechanical ventilator from acute pulmonary edema, that nitrates are great, and you scale up as long as you have enough room for blood pressure. Don't know about cardiogenic shock. Those people don't have enough blood pressure. And there is a price to pay. And actually, this is so good. The nitrates work so well in this setting that when they compare it even with BiPAP, okay, that we do all the time in CCU or in 71 ICU, they actually, patients on BiPAP, they got, so everybody got the dose of laser, dose of nitrates, and then they stuck the, the BiPAP on them and they gave them Lasix. And then 24 hours later, they saw who went to invasive ventilator. 70%. There's the same group who repeated the study a year later. I want to see it. And the ones who got the nitrate, way fewer went into the uh, mechanical ventilator. So, really, BiPAP just buys you some time. Unless you deliver the proper therapy, you won't prevent you from still going on the mechanical ventilator. So, this is powerful. Nitrates can help you for those extreme acute situations. But what do you do uh, in terms of uh, acute heart failure uh, and you put them on, you know, titrate against one, you see, here, the nitrate, nitroglycerin dose started at 40. Every 10 minutes, the nurse doubled it until the wedge here on the right went down anywhere between th uh, 3 to 7 millimeters mercury. So from 28, actually, to about 21 wedge. So indeed, it did drop this 7 millimeters mercury once you got to 160. But if you continue for 24 hours, even this high dose, with the risk of giving them an disease of normal, say, an hour, look what happened to the wedge next day. It goes back to almost normal. So this is called tachyphylaxis. So what you do, you have a short, quick window, got 24 hours. If you think you get them out of that mess in 24 hours, you're good. But if not, you may not necessarily help. And that's called nitroglycerin tachyphylaxis. There are ways how to get around that. Uh, but there is also another catch. If you were to look, okay, it's a vasodilator, but it's really a, what kind of vasodilator? Does it affect all vascular beds, bed, vascular beds the same way? And the answer is no. Look what happens. If I look at cardiac output, yes, it goes up at this high dose. 
But when I look at the blood in the gut, it goes down. And when I look at blood in the kidney, it goes down. So FYI, if this tells me that if I have somebody who's developing a urinary failure in the setting of flash pulmonary edema or heart failure, you may actually aggravate the renal perfusion and the renal function next day. And this happens quite frequent. I Now, do I know this for sure? In prospective randomized studies, no. But I can tell you, this is not my favorite based on this. Particularly, we know we have data from heart failure leisure showing that actually nitrates in high dose does increase neurohormones and may worsen renal blood flow. But again, this is high dose, but it's the same high dose is effective to treat those flash pulmonary edema and those extreme patients who can tolerate the nitrate. Okay? So FRI, I don't like to use it as a first line. Somebody's developing a renal failure in the same time. Okay? Just based on this. Now, how about, and that's what diuretics do too. They activate new hormones and do all that stuff. And the question is, why would nitroglycerin, this makes no sense. You're improving the cardiac output, so you should improve the renal blood flow, right? You're improving the cardiac filling pressures. Why can't you them be happy? It looks like the, the nitro will vasoconstrict the renal vascular bed to drive all the blood towards periphery. And if you think about it, what happens in septic shock when it's a lot of nitroglycerin around or nitric oxide around? That's what it does. It does a distributive shock. You actually vasoconstrict the periphery where you have your cellulitis infection and actually vasoconstrict the, the kidneys because that's where you get the blood most to go away. So to me, it actually does make sense because even cardiac output goes up. If it goes in the wrong place, I haven't really achieved much here. Okay? So other agents that we can use to actually improve that renal perfusion, be more selective on the renal perfusion, is actually renal, what we call renal dose or low dose dobutamine, dopamine, sorry. That's two to four mics. It's nothing more than five. At five, you start to have, an, you know, alpha vasoconstriction probably. So those studies have been done in patients with chronic or acute systolic heart failure. Indeed, we can increase anywhere from one up to five, you know, uh, renal perfusion, uh, by about 60-70%, while renal vascular resistance goes down. Uh, actually, you get a little bit of benefit of 25% increased cardiac output, but that's, again, very low-dose dopamine vasodilator, D1 activation. That's not the pressor dose, high dose, 10 mics or higher. Okay? So we could use that concomitant as a thought. How about dobutamine versus dopamine? Yeah, sure. It's a ninotropin this setting with the low index. should help. And look what it is. 7.5 mics per kilo per minute of dobutamine, you increase your index by about 20%. Yes, the renal perfusion, the labels are the same as here. This was on top of each other. So yes, you improve a little bit the renal perfusion. At least you're done making it worse. Um, and you may have a little bit of steel from the gut, but it's not a major problem. And you improve also the limb perfusion. But dopamine versus dobutamine, you see how dopamine lots more renal uh, blood flow infusion and less effect on the cardiac output. Mir uh, mirinon, it's excellent. It's an inodilator, inhibits phosphodiesterase, increasing cyclic MP in the cardiac myocyte contraction, increasing cyclic MP in the vessels, relaxation. One fits, you know, uh, one tool and you hit both. And that's wonderful. And it turns out that the vasodilation effect is pure because you give it peripheral. If you actually give it intracoronary, you don't have any systemic effect. And this is pretty much what this study is showing. All right. Side effect, hypotension, tachycardiacs, up to three times the incidence of AFib and VT. And of course, you, it's, I take it away if it's septic. It's a very potent vasodilator if you have sepsis or septic shock. Okay. Now, my favorite, so those who work with me, is hydrazine. It's a 50 years old drug. All right. It's cheap. So far, nobody has, you know, uh, stole it away and then increased the price by a thousandfold. Everybody likes it. It's safe. You know, every nurse is very comfortable with his IV or PO. Uh, so hopefully nobody will take my last drug away from me because they took away the Neseritai because it was too expensive. They took away nitro. I showed it for all practical purposes. It's completely useless for somebody who's sick and needs more than a day. There were, there were some advantage of Neseritai, by the way. It doesn't get the tachyphylaxis that happens. All right. Unfortunately, I had to have trial nesuritide versus nitroglycerin. Uh, it didn't show any improved mortality. A huge, beautiful trial, a sent trial. So everybody makes a good point. Why use $300 a day when the nitro will lower the wedge and improve shortness of breath as much as, uh, you know, nesuritide? So that's the problem. Uh, but those crying. So hydrazine, why do I like it? Well, it works because, look at it. First of all, I like it because it's a democratic vasodilator. 
you know, right? Everybody's happy. Everybody gets their money in equal distribution here. Cardiac output goes up, of course, secondary to lowering SVR. Renal perfusion, 40% up. You can give that as PO, as IV. I don't ever encourage to use PO in somebody with acute heart failure because it has horrible oral bioavailability. I would like to use IV. It costs almost the same. And is what you see is what you get, so you have an effect on blood pressure, as opposed to giving 100 and barely 20 gets absorbed, and you can't really control what and how. So if the patient in the hospital has heart failure, you know, if you really want to tune up with PO hydro with hydrolysis and give them IV, it's very easy. All right, and it's five to one ratio, so know that it's like synthroid. You really, uh, if you take don't take it on fasting, it's not going to work. Uh, it has this renal perfusion and cardiac output. Again, these are heart failure data. It's physiology. I don't have prospective randomized studies. Uh, I told you about the trick that right side heart failure is not going to absorb. And of course, you can get hypotension, tachycardia, and again, don't give it to a patient septic. How about ACE inhibitors? Yeah, they improve. Uh, this is a mega dose of 100 of captopril, but 50 will do it just fine. Improves the cardiac output a little bit and also is good for the renal perfusion. Now, there's a caveat with that. We're not going to use uh, POAC if somebody's in cardiogenic shock with the acute renal failure. So if the renal function is labile, I would then definitely use. But it's a stable creatinine. There is absolutely no problem with that. It does that. So let's go back after we review quickly this. What do we do for this patient? So in an algorithm, you know, in a stepwise fashion, we first, we added the balloon pump as again, even if it didn't show improvement mortality, you need to buy some time to figure what's going on, see if we can get this patient better. We use the balloon pump, particularly for the acute mitral regurgitation for afterload. Uh, then I started low dose hydrolysine. Then what I did, I used, you give 10 IV, 30 minutes later, you check it as the peak day effect. If the SVR hasn't changed, then you keep scaling up. And nothing happened even with 20. That means it was four so strong with this severe MR. Then we added nipride. And finally, I got with the nipride, the system vascular resistance about 1,000. Index is now borderline normal. Uh, you know, the wedge or the MR is still bad, heart rate is 60, and the patient keeps getting worse. So, so much to try to tune up a mechanical issue here. We still have acute bad MR. And this is what it looked like, and it appears so. And I, here's where I got stuck, and I didn't realize what's going on. Uh, and really, you can't really die with somebody with the kidneys are getting worse. If my, if your NAP is not increased, just diarising won't do anything with that. I know troops, we can try, but there's something here that is missing, you know. At least I did a stepwise approach. I first targeted that SVR, and I fixed that. I then targeted the cardiac index, and it's as good as you get. Now, theoretically, if the cardiac feeling pressure is elevated, if I die with somebody, it should be getting better. But something wasn't right here, because if I'm correct, and that's all the patient needed, the cardiac, everything is adequate, then why is the lung status getting worse. In other hypoxia is getting worse. That means the world that blood is still going backwards instead of going forward. And the kidney was getting worse. So just the numbers fixing the numbers didn't do the job. Well as is there. And here is what's there. What's there is the fact that I while I normalize this stem vascular resistance, I increased the uh, I, I uh, still have the heart functioning here and I have my mitral regurgitation is a problem. Okay? And I'll get to the bottom list. But for now I wanted to show you how we can play with the SWAN number. I have here seven case scenarios with the risk some of you will be bored to death. I created every single scenario that can occur in the ICU that actually if you know what's here, you know 95% of what I know to SWAN manage SWAN with SWAN the patients. It's very simple. And I'm going to walk you through this, okay? So here's how it goes. Uh, I This is a SWAN uh, for a patient. The index is 1.6, mix venous 52, SVR, is 2200, mean arterial pressure is 105, and the heart rate is 105. And all these are meaningful values. I'll show you why. Uh, CVP or right atrial pressure is 18. I put that because sometimes we have the map for the patient, sometimes we have the SVR. And you can pick whatever you want, but you can still use it. And this is the PA pressure. So what do we do for this patient? Well, clear was the worst part for this patient is the system vascular resistance, like our patient is 2200. So that will be my first goal, because that's probably the main contributor why the index is low, but also could be part of why the cardiac feeding pressures are elevated. So in this particular patient, the first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to use a vasodilator. I'm going to do my best in a goal-oriented approach to really get that 2200 back to 1,000. I do that, index goes up, and it's possible cardiac feeding pressure will get better. And why do we do that is because, you see, where is the patient now? It's here right at the bottom part, suppressed with the afterload. I want to shift this up 
and also it's here to the right. I want to eventually be able to get it to the right. So that's what I want to do. All right? And that's what I do. And after we do that, I used what, and you need to be able to actually change that. You know, it's just because I put them on antenna hydrolysis or some nitro. If that SVI has not changed, you haven't done anything. Sometimes you have to use stronger or less strong basal air, depending, whatever it takes to half an hour, an hour, two hours later, change that mineral to pressure and change that uh, SVR. So if you do that, then it's going to go down. And listen, what happens uh, after that? Sorry. <laughs> we go to uh, a, uh, we got an SVI of 1,000. Mineral to pressure now it's about 70. That's if you patients on the floor. I still have elevated cardiac feeding pressures. You know, mixed venous has improved a little bit, which goes with an index improve a little bit. But now, the main out variable that's wrong here is not the system vascular. That is, there is no more dynamic negative relationship between cardiac output and SVR. Here is a pure low cardiac output that is, I can't really fix that unless I'm adding an inotrope. So this to me, this is the time that you can safely add an inotrope. You are beyond vasodilators. And I'm going to add an inotrope. All right? And that's what we do. Now. This, the next patient suddenly has an SVR of 640, all right? And something is not right. The index is now, it's high cardiac output, is normal. Mixed venous is normal, 70%. Uh, a, oh, I have a sinus tachycardia just like the other. And, you know, the CVP is not so bad. It's right atrial pressure is below 10. Uh, wedge is 18, kind of borderline, but it's nothing major. So what's going on with this patient? By the way, these numbers that you see here, this is the patient hospital cost over 30 days after surgery. He went through each and every set of numbers that you see here. And it turns out, despite presenting as cardiogenic shock, he kept moving septic shock from bacteremia, other things. And just having the idea that EF is low and we keep thinking cardiogenic shock is not going to help. Why? Because this particular patient, to our surprise, if the SVI is so low, mean arterial pressure is low, pulse pressure is wide, this patient is septic. Even if three days ago he was in cardiogenic shock. And yes, the index will go up because I showed that vertical relationship with the afterload and you can get full. And it's important because I see then everybody jumping in here. This is cardiogenic shock and what you do, you will give them vasodilators. Or are you going to kill this patient? <laughs> and or you will give them an inotrope that has a vasodilator proper like Mirinor. You are not going to help. You're going to make it worse. Or you give them, uh, you know, diuretic. Well, definitely with sepsis and septic shock, you're not going to help with that. Okay, so we need to be able to interpret, and we interpret that if we have a swan with the SVR. If you don't have a swan, you look at mean arterial pressure, if it's below 65, and a wide pulse pressure, because you base a dilator, diastolic is down, systolic is up. So those are, and patients relative warm, talking to you, even blood pressure is low. All right, so that was that. So this particular patient, so what if he has heart failure and cardiogenic shock three days before? Actually, I'm going to put the more pressure. Why? Because, yes, the heart is enjoying a great cardiac index. But this index, it's a distributive shock. You have peripheral vasodilation and renal vasoconstriction. The blood is stolen away from the main organs, and what I call it's a wasted cardiac output. It's going the wrong place, and that's not what I want. So the longer you keep waiting and staring at this low MAP and low SVR, the more you're going to develop ATN and kidney failure. You have to fix that, put them on pressure so you distribute the blood back into the central organs, even if the index gets lower. The key is you don't want to raise the SVR higher than 1,000. So, of course, you don't want to go back to dopamine 20 and SVR 2,000. That's why you need invasive you know, hemodynamic assessment here. All right? Uh, how about the next one? Now, uh, we have an, now an SVR of 1,100. Um, the miniature pressure is right 21, around 70. I got a nice heart rate. Clear cardiac feeling pressures elevated, wedge is 28, and a uh, mixed venous about 64. So not so much, you know, a little low cardiac output, but nothing major. It's kind of okay. So what do I do next for this patient? What's my goal for this? So the SVR is at goal. The cardiac index is almost at goal. What's not a goal? Cardiac feeling pressures, right? So if I were to look at where this patient is, it's here to the right of this on the downslope of the Stalin curve with the wedge that's high. So I just need to move him here. Come over here. This is the time that I can, I should diarise the patient, basically, to drop. That's the only way I can drop this cardiac feeling pressure. All right? So this is the one that I like to diarise. This is the moment when I want. Why didn't diarise here? Because the index is so low, the kidney is hypoperfused, you're going to develop renal failure. I first want to give the best to improve that index and the SVR before I start, you know, uh, now, these were fixed. Now it's time to 
you know, diaries, and then you're just going to go. All right? Next, how about the, the, this uh, particular patient? SVI is 1300, mixed venous is 15, index is 1.5. All right? So I, you need to think again. Are we at the right of the Starling curve? Are we to the left of the Starling curve? Because remember, whether you are to the right or to the left, you still have low index. You want to be in the mean, you know, so this I just use this to diagnose. Well, look at this cardiac feeling pressure, even if it's mild severe cardiogenic shock by numbers, CVP is six, you know, wedge is 10. And what I think is going on, this patient is actually here on this side, okay, on the to the left of the curve. This is where you're so dry and preload dependent. Did you're going to hack so bad the cardiac output. And on the, if the patient is on the floor, they'll just become hypotensive, may or may not pass out. They'll be dizzy or orthostatic. Hopefully, we don't get them there. But that's, believe it or not, I gave this patient fluids. And the index has improved. All right? That's the treatment. Because how do I know that? My first goal was SVR is not so bad. The index is low, but it's not because of the SVR. It's because actually the cardiac feeling pressures are too low. Now, if the feeling pressures were... 28 and RA pressure of 20, then you know, we are exactly at the right. Then this patient is truly low cardiac, cardiogenic, you know, advanced cardiogenic shock. So it's not that hard. You just have to think where do you have to the right, to the left, top or bottom in terms of vertical starling curve. All right, two more scenarios, and this is more for advanced, you know, fellows who work with this in critical care. You can have actual scenario where every SVR, everything is, is good. Uh, you have a here a low cardiac feeling pressure in the same patient. Mixed venous is low. Looks like it's in cardiogenic shock by mixed venous. But those critical care doctors, you know, pulmonary like Dr. Velasquez, would be surprised. Why is the index out of proportion high with a mixed venous of 50%? And now I notice CVP is 3. This patient is actually bleeding because we calculate the fit cardiac out based on the mixed venous and hemoglobin concentration. So actually this patient has a, a true low mixed venous from having too low hemoglobin. So these people are actually combined with hemorrhagic and we give them blood, all right? And that could be the issue. Now, last but not least is actually our patient. I had to go through all this to get up here, all right? Why? Because I seem to have fixed everything hemodynamics was for the patient, and yet something wasn't. But there's one more thing we can do, because, and here's what we can do. Yes, I got the SVR where you needed. The mirror threshold was needed. And you see what I put in red was highly abnormal. If we are in cardiogenic shock or any kind of shock that drops our blood pressure that needs pressure, we should have a heart rate of 100 or 110. It shouldn't be, or 20. And the higher, the more that advances the shock. It shouldn't be 60. So actually, I was giving a lecture at Emory for a fellow at 7 a.m. when they called me, and I said, what's the heart rate? 60. And the patient developed basically a complete heart block, part of the inferior wall MI at that time. So actually, if we can do something to increase this heart rate appropriate to 100, then that's okay. So some of our patients with heart failure, they can have a biventricular pacemaker, they can have a pacemaker. You can manipulate that heart rate. You go up to 100, and suddenly you can almost double your cardiac output. This particular patient uh, is already in complete heart block. It's already not benefiting from the atrial kick. We actually put a transvenous pacer. We pace him at, the, uh, at 100 beats per minute. And actually, after we did that, uh, it's gotten better. And again, remember the formula? What we did with the with the SVR afterload and preload and inotropes, we maxed out the, everything we can do out of that stroke volume. But in other words, if the maximum stroke volume was required was 100, but we, whatever we did, we only got it to 60, okay? To really make it up, you need to have a heart rate to get that cardiac output so you get total renal perfusion per uh, minute that's adequate. And this is what happened. And believe it or not, that's all we did. Patients started to pee. Uh, where it started to come down, when I see that you're not putting increase to 100 ml an hour, which is over 60, that's when I said, okay, kidney is ready to go. I gave, we gave a idea of Lasix, bang, furosemide, P3 liters. Next day, credit was 1.2. So uh, FIO2 got down to 40. So what do you think I said to Dr. Paskas next day? Time to go to OR. I said, that's as much time I can buy. And at least we got him out of uh, lung organ failure, kidney organ failure, and of course, uh, wait to wait. Went to OR, got the usual eight-hour surgery because a lot of things needed a pacemaker, it needed a valve, it needed you know five vessel cabbage. You know, eight hours later, it's in ICU. It's cold and clammy. It's on every maximum pressure you can imagine. These are the swan numbers. I think right now I don't even need to go anymore over through that because you have your goals of therapy. So which one are we going to attack first? 
here, an SVR of 2,400. And it's easy to attack because that's why we have the SWAN. So bottom line, never place a SWAN if you're not going to use it. If you're not going to check the numbers and actually change your therapy the next minute, forget about using a SWAN. And I think the most important reason why SWAN trials have failed is because I don't think we actually use them properly. All right. You have to actually work. You have to put it back to part of the vitals and react to it. So this particular patient had all this cocktail of press or inertos, vasodilators, negative inertos, pretty much you're doing everything everywhere. But there is no clear goal where this is going and manage the patient. To me, I need to cut the pressors because the SVR is that we're back to where we are. The only difference that we have now, you see how the numbers look the same, except we have a valve now. <laughs> That's the only difference. So we can that. But the good news, I don't have to worry about MR right now. So this next, I basically, ISVR is too high. Again, having a gold star with that. Also, I was worried that the index is low, but he was getting metoprolol uh, IV, 5Q6 for his AFib. Well, really, then what's the point of using inotropes if you're using 5 of metropol IV? Just so you know, 5 of IV of metropol, it's equivalent of peak plasma concentration of 50 PO of metropol short acting or 200 of XL. So it's not something neg negligible. You're giving a lot on this patient's with cardiogenic shock. Just because it's a little in IV doesn't mean the concentrations are the same. So you got to know your numbers. Uh, so then you, I start to clean up those medicine and say, okay, my goal is get that 1,000 uh, SVR. Uh, and I've, we titrated the pressors off. We got an index now of 2.4, SVR of 1,100, wedge is 8, 22. And again, I got now, I fixed. So the kidney is no longer vasoconstricted. That's why I got the SVR where it needs to. That means I opened the kidney faucet. Now I have plenty of cardiac output. Now wedge is high. This is the time when we need to diarrhea. So I know, and really the patient in all our for cabbage, they got an average five to 10 liters of fluid. So time to start to remove that. And that's exactly what we did. All right. And now, uh, five days later, the patient has exactly that scenario showing you on the SWAN numbers. Low SVR, index is three, wedge is 28, CVP is seven, blood pressure is 88 over 40, but was warm. So this is not cardiogenic shock. And of course, that's not what immediately everybody, you know, has got, uh, started to be resuscitated or blood pressure is low. Uh, to me, there is no point of doing fluid resuscitation. If you have your invasive hemodynamics showing your wedge is 28, you're already over fluid resuscitated. It makes no sense. All you do is keep the patient on a breathing machine because every fluid you give is going to stay in the lung and will make them worse. So again, if you have a swan, use it. Don't ignore the numbers. You have the ultimate gold standard of intravascular volume there when you have that. That is what we've been using for 100 years. All right, so no point of resuscitating. I know blood pressure is low, but yes, it could be fluid. But if you are beyond fluid resuscitation, then you can go down to something else. You know, So the patient is drowning, and you are on the wrong side. And here, we keep thinking he's got cardiogenic shock because we know he's got low EF and all the other stuff. But really, we're not dealing with a here uh, vasoconstrictor response. We're dealing with vasorelaxation response, OK? from this and with volume overload. So it's a little different situation here, don't assume. And what happens, obvious for all practical purposes, the patient is pressor with, well, with a blood pressure of 80 over 40 and is warm. We're dealing with a, a vasodilated distributive shock. And this has been described a long time ago. Uh, we call it distributive shock. It means periphery vasodilates, but kidneys and the central organ actually vasoconstrict. So you distribute the blood to where the fight is and makes sense. And that's the purpose of that nitric oxide, INOS, that I was telling you. You get the macrophages to the periphery, you release a thousand-fold higher nitric oxide level than you were to do in a normal vessel. Basically, the vessels get completely paralyzed, don't respond to any, any norepinephrine, and then you dread, get your red blood cells, your white blood cells, platelets there, and everything else. Price you pay, central organs are going to have hypoperfusion. And specifically, if they have prior hypoperfusion to begin with, like if you have prior heart failure, prior kidney failure, then these patients are high risk with any kind of septic shock, they're going to develop renal failure. As a matter of fact, number one cause of acute renal failure in the hospital is uh, sepsis in the ICU settings. Everybody knows that, every nephrologist, every ICU specialist. All right? And again, it's easier to get it if you have prior kidney or heart disease. So this particular patient, if we're looking at my faucet analogy, here wasn't an issue that there wasn't enough blood supply going to the rest of the body. It's just it was going distributed 
especially the rest of the body, is stealing away from the kidney. This time we have a hot faucet. So how do we recognize that? SVA is less than 800. But also, if you don't have in the invasive swan, you look at the, uh, the blood pressure. 80 over 40, you have a white pulse pressure. That's not cardiogenic shock, as long as it's reliable. And a diastolic less than 50, unless you have severe AI, there is now many conditions that will cause that. So that's white pulse pressure and low mean arterial pressure less than 65. Patient warm talking to you. It's got plenty of blood, including in the brain. It's just stealing away from the gut and from the kidneys. All right? And basically, uh, this purpose is not to go over septic shock. And everybody knows it is really distribution. Eventually, we hit the trouble when we hit the anaerobic, anaerobic threshold. So we always check as an evolution what's happening with, uh, we check an ac lactic acid level, a mixed venous from the PA distal PA port and the ABG. And, you know, a long time ago, reverse, excuse me, has shown that you have a, uh, you got to be aggressive, an early goal-oriented approach strategy is very important ideally within six hours there's been some criticisms with that but having said that you have a goal-oriented approach that means you target first the fluid status then the hemodynamics then the need for inotropes then actually you can save 45 percent of this patient with improved mortality of two months this is the famous reverse style since then this has been kind of updated with various other things but bottom line uh initial fluid resuscitation uh, my purpose is here to show how you do that in the context of prior cardiac renal disease because comorbid illnesses. This has not been addressed in those trials. And unfortunately, this is all bread and butter in the ICU and you know, or in the floor. These are uh, patients with comorbid illnesses. To me, if you have any prior cardiac or renal issue, you got to be careful going crazy with one or three liters of fluid over a few hours, okay, in this patient. Unless you have absolute certitude they are truly dehydrated. Those I will actually work that have pre-existing disease, I like. I rather use like the ringer or half normal sain to minimize the salt because a liter of normal sain has nine grams of salt. If they retain sodium, for each gram they'll retain a pound later on at the end of the hospital. So you gave them a liter, they will have right now just a liter. You don't see a lot of volume overload, but those nine grams will be nine pounds three, four, five days from now. Every water that you have there will stay chemically attracted to the sodium. So if you give half normal sense, it's only half of that. You minimize, mitigate that problem so you don't have to remove it after that. The second thing is, and of course, if you've got to give large volume, it's hypotonic, then safe will be to use like the ringer. This way, everybody's happy. It's not hypotonic and that kind of stuff. If the patient clears volume overloaded, I don't care how septic it is. These are the patients who benefit from actually swan. Why? I need to absolutely know the gold standard of what's the cardiac feeling pressure where the patient needs a fluid or it doesn't need a fluid. Why? Because if the wedge is 20 and you're pulling those one to three liters of fluid, then you're going to have a patient who's going to be in the vent forever there. And I don't care, but I can tell you, you know, the antibodies don't work in patients with pulmonary edema. It doesn't matter how hard you try to push them in that lung that's wet. So this is very important to me. It pays to first do the swan and I would consider first. And CVP is not adequate. We have a lot of controversy in the literature. You need to have the wedge, period. Okay? So I have a low, and this is being described in literature. Many patients may save them with the sepsis, but then you have prolonged non-cardiac, what they call non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, especially patients, you know, they have also systemic inflammation. Leaky pulmonary capillary is not just a hemodynamic problem. So we really try to minimize that uh, to prevent long-term uh, vent requirements. Uh, and if you, uh, so we're done with fluid resuscitation. First, do not harm. If you are in doubt that this patient is uh, intravascular depleted, you, you know, or prior kidney or heart failure, low EFs, go ahead and move them in ICU, fluid resuscitate them, but after you swan them. All right. Second, press or resuscitation. So we already fluid resuscitated. I show you the data that really dopamine, high dose dopamine is not adequate. Remember, for all comers with shocks in the ICUs, Still, 60% are distributive shock, plus minus combined with something else. And really, the cardiogenic shock is only 15, 16%. Rest are hypovolemic or what they call obstructed or very few, like cardiac tamponade or aortic stenosis. Uh, recently, in terms of how do you uh, resuscitate with vasopressors, really the best data we have for no epinephrine, not dopamine, and for vasopressin. Vasopressin is extremely useful after you have no epinephrine particularly in patients with low ejection fraction. For some reason, our bioreceptors, if we have heart failure or hypotension with that, are 
not releasing and firing to release enough vasopressin when you are hypotensive. So that reflex is numb. Normally, suddenly we get a septic shock stimulus, MAP goes below 70, by receptor, we release about a hundredfold higher basal pressure within five minutes. And this has been shown. And then eventually it goes down. And that's why some of us can compensate for a while and not being hypotensive under the same endotoxin stress and some won't. But patients with low EF will have way less release, lower uh, release of vasopressin. They are relative vasopressin deficient. And there is a lot of things that vasopressin does acutely in this setting. Actually, they show if you give it back, it helps to reduce the recurrent level of fat. And I can go over how this works, but bottom line is vasopressin is able to, when you have lactic acidosis in the smooth muscle, this uh, uh, potassium uh, leaks out of the cell through a special channel and keeps the calcium out of the cell. So even if you start to go up on your catecholamine, no epinephrine, epinephrine is like they're biting on a smooth muscle, but they have no teeth because calcium doesn't go inside the cell. And what the vasopressin does in those with lactic acidosis, blocks this channel, like keep the percentage of the cell, and makes the cell, again, sensitive to calcium, and less the calcium. So basically, resensitize with adrenaline. Again, this just buys time. It's not an antibiotic, but at least if you want to uh, rescue the organs and prevent organ failure, that's what it's supposed to do. And this was published in a vast trial a few years ago, with excellent uh, study that's showing that if you have advanced septic shock and you go up on the norepinephrine, instead of keep going a mega dose of norepinephrine, once you get to about 10, add vasopressin, and those will be able to save the, the low, uh, lower risk septic shock patient, not the high risk septic shock patient. Which means is, their hypothesis is actually, if you add vasopressin and norepinephrine, you're going to save more the one with the more severe septic shock, right? Provided that the septic shock is caused by, uh, or the severity of it depends on, on that, but that's not what it depends. It depends on the underlying severity of the reason for the shock. So you have a resistant Klebsiella. You can add the mother of the vasopressin and any pressors you want. Nothing is going to happen. So I think their hypothesis is a little bit upside down here. So to their surprise, it did improve mortality in those with low uh, risk of, sep of uh, mortality from septic shock. And it tells you, yes, it buys you time. It's effective. Instead of keep cams coming up, add vasopressin on epinephrine, add vasopressin. But meanwhile, make sure you identify a reversible etiology of that septic shock. Otherwise, the patient is still not going to survive. And you've got to be aggressive with that. So that's the take-home message. So to me, if I were to now go all the way down here, this is the algorithm. I'm not going to uh, go over that. First, if I have septic shock, I first look if I need to fully resuscitate. Obviously, even if it's low EF, if the patient is dry, I'm going to do that. If I have evidence like here, this patient at the wage of 24 is already high. I'm not going to. He's already fully resuscitated. Go and blood pressure is low. I go down the organ. I need to increase that SVR. First, norepinephrine is first line. Second line is vasopressin. If norepinephrine gets higher than 10 mics, that means patient is already catecholamine kind of resistant. And this is data-driven outcome. And then when do I add inotro for this patient is when I have a mixed venous less than 65, I have lactic acidosis, and I have a pH less than 7.35. That means this particular heart has tried its best to provide, deliver the proper oxygen for the demands. Unfortunately, it reached the anaerobic threshold, and we're going the wrong way. So I'm going to uh, improve it with inotrop. I prefer the butyrmine because it's not vasodilating at this dose. At 10 or higher, it is. And then mirinone actually can aggravate the rhythm. So that's the septic shock algorithm, and that's pretty much, I think, widely accepted this point in the literature, plus minus. If I were to summarize our night, uh, no, vasodilators used, I pretty much told you about this. I'm, I'm running, I'm already run out actually of time, so I'd be happy to email this presentation to anybody else. It's pretty much a summary of what I showed about vasodilators. And if I were to come up with an algorithm and say, how can we consistently do, you know, proceed with this? If somebody comes in a hospital with acute on chronic heart failure, and obviously it's progressing towards cardiogenic shock, the first thing you do, even if or they come through ER or emergency room or through the cath lab, you assess whether they are wet and cold. Cold meaning SVR is high. Wet uh, is telling you that it's got fluid overload. That means the heart is functioning on that downslope part of the star linker. So you're to the right. Okay, I look at the mean arterial pressure. Again, not just systolic, not just diastolic. And I look at the pulse pressure. If it's over 70, to me, I have enough room to at least attempt some vasodilators, okay? Uh, if that, and I use the inotropes as a second line. 
the reason why we should only start with this is because we have we have clinical trials with mirin or dobutamine first line all comers with heart failure in the hospital and the mortality is worse so we can't just use it then discriminatory on everybody because they'll Although it will make us feel safe with the blood pressure part, but it's not safe with arrhythmia, SVT, and SVT. So we got to select those like that. Then the second thing, uh, if that doesn't work, as they clear kidneys are worse, things are worse, you can get, if you're worried that the patient could be in shock, even it looks like a little cool, I don't know, uh, you can actually order lactic acid. It comes back in 30 minutes, all right? It's actually faster than the chem 7 all right? If your airway is two, if you get that two or higher than two, that confirms your physical exam. You should move those patients to the unit. Don't play when they need inotropes, okay? And I'm suggesting it's not part of the guidelines. Don't quote me the wrong way. It's just an extra objective thing. If you have a peak line already for other reasons for the patient, check a mixed venous. You won't be a perfect distal PA pre, you know, catheter, but if I see it's 70, you know, you got to add 3% to whatever is there. So if I see 70, the patient is not in cardiogenic shock. If I see 40 to 45, I can add 3 or 5. It's still very low output. So again, it can help you to do that. You can always get an ABG if you are worried. Now, what if I have a patient who has a map of 70, a pulse pressure of, you know, that, that means systolic minus diastolic divided by systolic less than 25? Well, these are really cardiogenic shock patients. They have a true low blood pressure, main arterial pressure less than 70, and I have a pulse pressure less than 25. These patients need to move to the unit, in my opinion, and uh, you got to start with a nitro. If really MAP is less than 65, we don't have any choice but the butamine, all right? Because mirinon can actually drop that blood pressure, particularly if you have some sepsis undergoing. So I start with the butamine. If it's uh, 75, 80, I have some room there with narrow pulse pressure, then we use mirinon for that. All right, and I switch the patient to in the unit. And then third, last, and then there are other things that you can use the vasodilators I put up here. But what's more important is to be able to recognize when you can have mixed or septic shock going on at the same time with the patient. And again, you have the same inner tear pressure is low, but they have a wide pulse pressure. Patient is relatively warm talking to you. Remember a patient who's hypotensive because of cardiogenic shock, they'll all be cold, clammy, adrenaline release. They won't be warm and and looking good. So again, suspect the patient is septic, even if they may have a prior EF of 20%. And these are the ones that then I move them in the ICU. If I need to swan them, I swan them, and I move along the septic shock algorithm. All right, so I'm at the end, and I thank you because you've stayed 10 minutes over. I'm sorry for that, but anyway.